Gots is an oasis of sound. The song is free of all the spooky, fantastical, overwhelming soundscapes that make up Berserk. The song is slow, calming, but still no less haunting with these siren moans crooning along to the piano. The piano itself is an unusual choice given the rest of the soundtrack's electronic, pulsating synths, which is very on brand for Susumu Hirosawa's style. But even on Gots, there remains this trickle of noises underneath the piano that sound ominous and subterranean, like you're underwater. The whole thing is reverbed, so it sounds like it's echoing into this empty void, and the repetitive melody adds to this echo, creating a hypnotic trance. It doesn't sound like a track that would even come from a series like this, but it's arguably the most important piece of music in the series, because it orchestrates some of the most integral scenes of Berserk. There are 10 scenes where it shows up across the 25 episodes, only totaling 22 minutes out of the 543 minute runtime, but it's just as important to highlight where Gotts does not play instead of where it does. It never plays during an action scene. The closest is episode 2 where it plays over a flashback, but it doesn't play during that fight. It never plays during battles, nor during any encounters with any monsters like Zod, the God Hand, nor else with any depictions of violence. Instead, Gots plays in moments before a fight, like Guts' first duel with Griffith, but most often after a fight, like Guts' second fight with Griffith, after Guts kills a hundred men, after the assassination. Put more simply, Gots is exclusive to moments of peace. The Golden Age arc is arguably the period of Berserk with the least amount of danger, when this existential supernatural threat is at its weakest, as well as when these life or death moments mean the least. The conceit of the show is never, can Guts and the Band of the Hawk defeat what's-his-name and climb their way to the top of the kingdom, the focus is actually on Guts, Griffith, Casca, and what each of them seek in life. What is their dream? their ambition, their prerogative. One of storytelling's most fundamental tools is asking, what does the character want? And most often the dramatic action is driven by characters getting what they want or not. But what I love about Berserk, at least before the Eclipse, is how it's not about that chase, but why chase, how chase, what chase, who chase. And that's what Gots is used to orchestrate. The first scene is the end of episode 2 when Griffith asks Guts to join them, but it's more than that. Griffith is the first person in Guts' life to show genuine compassion for him, expressing a desire to be with him and identifying Guts' struggle for his meaning in life. I want you to join me, Guts. It's still early in the show, but up until this point there had been no semblance of kindness or warmth in Berserk. It was bleak and bitter and cruel. God's theme invokes welcoming, understanding, and acceptance. It's so counter to Guts' entire being, he violently rejects it, the song ending abruptly with a clashing of swords. I hope you drop dead in battle, and soon. The second scene is the shortest appearance in the show, when Guts realizes Casca protected him from being killed by Corcus and his men. While she doesn't express any compassion like Griffith, it nevertheless represents a respite that's uncommon in Guts' life. While he's still bitter over being defeated in battle by Griffith, Guts invokes relief, sanctuary, and promise of a peaceful rest. One that Guts probably hasn't had in years, but with his teddy bear, gladly indulges in. The third scene is also brief, episode 7 after Guts talks with Griffith about their encounter with Zod. He asks why Griffith risked his life to save him when he's only one of hundreds of soldiers under his command. Griffith dodges the question, asking Guts if he even needs a reason every time he lays his life down for him. 
Those words linger in Guts for hours into the evening, where he's alone with his sword. Guts plays here and not during that talk, because it's not until this point that Guts realizes he actually did get his answer. He said for you. Griffith is more than his commander, his boss, his day job. It's his purpose, although he's not completely sure. But for now, it's good enough. Gots invokes resolution, kinship, purpose. He's found his calling, and that is Griffith. In episode 10, my personal favorite scene, Griffith is talking with Princess Charlotte in private, with Guts, who has just completed Griffith's order to assassinate her uncle, observing from afar. It's not until Griffith starts to speak about dreams does Gots start playing. I won't try to explain it, Griffith truly speaks for himself and lays out his view of the world plainly. I think the more important thing to note here is that Griffith doesn't seem to know Guts is listening. Whether the things he says here are sincere or simply to flatter the princess into loving him, it's not something he intends Guts to hear. Griffith alludes to Guts as dead for having no dream of his own, and radically shifts Guts' perception of the two of them being true friends. But despite this cold shoulder from Griffith, Guts invokes ambition, life, and most importantly becomes a sonical allegory for dreams. When Griffith declares his true friend is one that is his equal, the theme is struck dead in its tracks, as that stirring warm feeling in Guts turns sour and cold. For me to call a man my friend, he must be equal to me in all respects. In episode 12, a scene focusing mostly on Casca's relationship to Griffith has Guts silent but no less involved as he was at the fountain. Guts begins when Casca interrupts Griffith's self-harming, an act that disturbs her faultless, unwavering idea of him, and he turns to her, restored to that image she surrendered herself to. From there, she waxes on how torturous yet inspiring Griffith's dream is, how she sees herself fitting into that picture, and how everything got disturbed by Guts' inclusion. Guts invokes, masterfully, several contrasting feelings. Empowerment and helplessness, desire and rejection, trust and confusion. Why you? Why did he choose you of all people? Why you? Episode 14, the iconic bonfire of dreams scene, sees Guts and Casca reflecting on their place and purpose in the band. It's a sizable scene that Guts appears on the tail end of, when they begin describing this analogy of each member being a small flame that is added to the raging inferno that is Griffith. It's the first time Guts opens up about himself, how up until now he's only known how to wield the sword, how fighting to survive is no way to truly live and expressing frustration with others finding a reason for him. Anyway, I imagine this all sounds pretty dumb. I'm sorry I brought it up. I'm not even sure why I did. Guts plays here because Guts is tapping into what he's learning in all these other scenes thus far with Guts. Each of the song's feelings that it's invoking are compounding on one another, this time invoking self-worth, longing, and even a kind of dread when Casca recognizes for the first time Guts' desire to leave the Hawks. In episode 17, we see Casca and Guts outside the ball, where Casca is ridiculing herself in a dress, and Guts starts playing when Guts compliments her. No, you look very lovely. Really? Sure. Far better than those noble girls crowding around Griffith. Gotts invokes the support and dedication that Guts has for Griffith in this scene, but it's also the first moment of intimacy, which will be fully realized later. But more importantly, it's used to call back those wavering feelings of dread that Casca had of Guts planning to leave the Hawks, and for the last time this theme is cut short before that question can be answered. Now, arguably the most pivotal moment of the show, episode 19, Guts has just defeated Griffith in a duel and separates from the Hawks without looking back. 
Gods has never played during such a tense moment, but its warmth is needed now more than ever. Not just to empower Guts' newfound freedom, but to embolden his feelings for Griffith as well. Guts finally reciprocates what Griffith once gave to him. You're going to be alright. You just stumbled over a stone in the road. It means nothing. Gots invokes compassion, encouragement, and hope. I'm sure you'll overcome this. You'll walk again. Soon. Nearing the end, episode 21, Guts is reunited with the Hawks, and a spat with Casca ends with Casca nearly killing herself. Guts saves her, they embrace, and Guts accompanies their full intimacy. Casca finds a true purpose in being with Guts, not just being a follower. And Guts invokes love, passion, euphoria. There may be a place for me in this man's soul. Not because of what I may receive, but for something of worth I may have for him. Arguably the most charming moment comes when the two of them have another spat immediately after about Guts leaving her again. But Guts comes back for an encore, with Guts asking Casca come with him this time. You could come with me. Because Guts has found a purpose with Casca as well. Guts invokes the future, unity, and romance. The final scene with Guts is bittersweet, as the show does end in tragedy. Episode 23, Guts is talking with Judo about the future, and members of the Hawk beg Guts to take them with him. They all want to be with him. Please take us with you. Commander! Commander! Take, take us with you, Commander! Yeah, take us with you, Commander! Take us with you, Commander! Guts wonders if this is what he's been searching for all this time. And Guts invokes belonging, happiness, but also a little regret as Guts ominously asks himself. But everything I wanted back then is right here before me now. Why don't I ever realize what I have until it's lost to me? Guts is a theme that sparks all these positive ideas in a series plagued by demons, soaked in blood and consumed in darkness. It's a light for these characters, and by extension, we, the audience. The series opens every episode asking if the destiny of mankind is controlled by some transcendental entity, and sinisterly concludes that man has no control of his own will. And Gotts functions against that idea, romanticizing the freedom of choice, setting on your own path, chasing your dreams, finding your purpose. And yet, why does the song sound so ethereal, soupy, bored? It's because Gotts is intangible. It's detached from the reality of Berserk that is literally getting fingered by a god hand. When I said Gots is an oasis of sound, that oasis is a mirage. The glory it promises isn't actually going to come. Nobody is getting what they want. At least, not without a sacrifice. But make no mistake, that warmth was real. The song is no less sweet. All those emotions shared and experienced by Guts, Griffith, Casca, they did happen. The tears and chills that this song summons from me do exist. Guts is only a song, like a siren calling out for you, only to drag you underwater. But even if things do end up 
poorly. I'm glad it made me feel this way. And when I ask myself what Berserk sounds like, this is all I can really think of. Emotional, beautiful, and tragic. Well, I hope that didn't make you too dizzy. Thank you so much for stopping by. More videos on things that are not remotely as popular as Berserk are on their way, including over an hour-long video on Ojimajo Dorimi, so be sure to subscribe for more. I actually have a second channel where you can see my face discussing other anime YouTube videos every week. And if you want to support me and even see how I made this video, you can become a patron like these guys and gals who made this video possible, including a tree outside, beam burst, cam, ginkgo talk, Jalen, 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 Riga Fag, Rob, Seaweed Ambassador, and Tengoon. Always a pleasure, and I'll see you again. Oh, and God, please watch this video I did on Mamoru Hosoda's work on TV anime. He helped direct One Piece's G8 arc. It's really, really cool. Thanks so much. Bye.